Welcome to the Sufan Center's panel discussion on gender roles and national security. Joining us right now are panelists Rebecca Weiner. She is the Assistant Commissioner for Intelligence Analysis for the NYPD's Intelligence Bureau. And we also have Professor Fanula Nieloin. She's the Special Rapporteur for Counterterrorism and Human Rights for the UN. With only 21 heads of state out of 193 countries being women, and the US um, just getting its very first vice president elect in Kamala Harris. The question is, has the national security field welcomed as many women as it should? And where do we go from here? Rebecca, why don't you kick it off? All right, um, well, it's inspiring and it's historic and um, we're all tremendously excited to see what the Biden administration, the Biden Harris administration um, is, is going to be able to do with all of the myriad of crises that confront it right now. Um, and it isn't just the only major headline so far as women in government is concerned. Uh, we also have historic representation in Congress to talk about, which is a big deal as well. 135 female members of Congress now, 13 new Republican members of the House, a delegation from my home state of New Mexico, which is entirely women and women of color, um, the first openly transgender senator from Delaware. Uh, so a lot of big news in terms of representation. Um, all that said, I think that there is still a long way to go. And you know, for one thing, we're still counting and qualifying and, and congratulating ourselves rightfully on these historic moments. But I think the desired end state would be uh, a conversation that I had with my three-year-old and five-year-old yesterday. And I said, what do you think about the fact that there's a new um, vice president and is a woman? And they sort of looked at me confused. It would never occur to them that that was anything other than totally ordinary. So I personally look forward to the moment when these historic strides are utterly unremarkable. Fanola, what do you think? So maybe just to speak from the kind of global perspective of what it means to have a female vice president in the United States, I think many have observed over many years how extraordinary it is that the United States, such an important beacon for democracy and equality and non-discrimination, um, have observed how extraordinary it is that it has been so difficult for women to accede to those really significant and powerful uh, roles, both politically and in the security space. So I think there's an enormous symbolic resonance for the United States to have elected a female uh, woman of color and South Asian Asian woman to this role. And um, I think, of course, we have many remarkable women leading uh, in other parts of the world. So I think it's going to be extraordinary to see what that kind of the newness of these faces uh, means. And in particular, I think it may, it, it, it's not only the symbolic significance of it, but really to think about what differences, in fact, this may make to policy. And um, we've seen some remarkable policy uh, directions from countries that are women-led in the security arena. Uh, and I think, uh, I think we will all be watching with interest to see whether the appointment of a woman to this role really creates that kind of transformative shift or a different kind of perspective uh, and articulation uh, in US foreign policy uh, in particular. Now, before we dig into what women in particular bring to policymaking and how that might be different from their male counterparts, um, I, I want to look at the example of the German chancellor, um, the New Zealand prime minister, two women um, re-elected to top posts um, in Merkel's case multiple times. What does that say uh, about the voters? What does it say about the political system? Fadula, do you want to jump in? Sure. So, I mean, I, I think political systems produce equality. So we have to have systems that are sort of leaning into, to use that phrase, 
these outcomes that enable and facilitate them so that they're not aberrational. And sometimes what that means is actually that it's really clear in using the kind of phrase that Rebecca used, that it's unremarkable that women can come through in these ways and that the pathways are really obvious. That includes obvious pathways to be elected. So it's unremarkable, whether it's through the use of party lists or clear preferences to ensure that, um, that there's diversity in the, in the selection election processes for women's political participation and elected election, but also to look at Jacinta Arden as a good example that that the kind of modeling of both family life in which a partner would look after a newborn child and that partner would be male sort of elevates the, the, the sort of normalization that these roles can be done um, by two people and uh, that parents, both parents of both genders play an equally essential role and can sort of dig in at the same way. And I think what's also really significant about both of these uh, examples that you've given, Kimberly, um, if we think about both the kind of the symbolism of Jane Arden's uh, win in New Zealand, which was an extraordinary majority, very unique in New Zealand, because that has not been typically the outcome of New Zealand. It tends to have had a model of, of splintered government. And, and that's also, uh, I think, singularly related to the kind of steadfast and unique leadership model that she has espoused, which is one around solidarity. It's one about empathy. It's one about inclusion, most notably illustrated by her response to the Christchurch, to the massacre uh, in New Zealand, um, her choice to um, engage with the communities who were harmed in very particular ways, uh, her choice to, to go into a group of grieving victims of terrorism wearing a veil. All of those things are, they're, on the one hand, they're really small gestures, but they're extraordinary, powerful gestures. It speaks to what kind of gendered gestures can do. Um, and I think we could see Camilla Harris actually doing some of that gesturing in her speech last weekend. She wore a white suffragette suit. And if a man wore a white suit, we might not comment on it. But of course, there's a sort of a, a, a symbolism that can be harnessed in really powerful ways. And Merkel, I think, also stands for the extraordinary proposition of strength in, 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 in leadership by women, not soft power plays, uh, not, a, not, a, not a less robust uh, response in, in really hard issues, including security issues, but, an idea, but the idea that those two things can be found in the female body, which again should not be unremarkable, but I think is an enormously significant way of understanding the diversity of roles and personalities um, that women bring to uh, these arenas. And then, of course, though, I'm thinking to myself, isn't Merkel just um, fulfilling another role that already exists in society, the character of the strong, firm mother? There's sort of a maternal role for her to fill out. In other words, that, that's how it fits into the public's mind, that she's, yes, she's powerful, um, but not in an aggressive way. I mean, maybe just to say it's it's really easy to essentialize women and we have to be really careful of that. And of course, there are these tropes of maternalism or other strong tropes, including the barriers that women of color have to face when their other negative tropes are used against them in public domain. So we have to caution ourselves against them and yet recognize the power of those tropes for positive, but also to sort of box women in in ways that are unduly essentialist. I agree. And I think there are such distinct and powerful examples of extraordinary leadership and leadership in crisis. And, you know, I would point to not just Christchurch, but also New Zealand's handling of the COVID pandemic and Germany too, confronting all sorts of different crises, crises over the last several years. Uh, and so I agree that we ought to be careful not to map on to these disparate leaders and their leadership qualities, um, an overly gendered sense of what roles they're embodying, uh, but just to recognize the fact that they are very adroitly leading their countries 
through these very tricky periods of, of history in very different ways. I um, completely agree. What I'm trying to say is that in the public's mind, they're like, okay, I have these categories for women. One yeah. of them is strong mother. Therefore, I'm okay with Angela Merkel being firm um, and authoritative because that fits into this idea I have of women. Yeah. And where yeah. I was going to go with that is, but what if you have someone like a Senator Kamala Harris, who was uh, an aggressive prosecutor. And so in the Senate, she did amazing cross examinations and she got the ball buster label because that doesn't seem to fit into one of our categories. Mm -hmm. It's true. And, and yet she's the VP. So my hope is that as distinct heterogeneous personalities are occupying these roles, that kind of lexicon we have of what women leaders should be like is going to expand uh, to just include the way it does for men, different personality traits in general and how those leadership characteristics work and don't work in, in different situations. So I think that that's why it's important to have more of women in these positions of power. So our own understanding of what it means to be a woman in power is a lot more nuanced uh, as a result. And, and I'm excited that that's sort of the direction we're heading, albeit slowly. So why do you think the United States has taken so long to catch up to other countries at putting a woman in one of those top slots? I mean, maybe to say, I think we have um, a deeply gendered society. It's not the only one that's deeply gendered. We've seen um, the, some of the political divisions in this country clearly map on to very distinct understandings, including of the family, of the female body, of the appropriateness of female uh, participation in public life. Um, as Rebecca pointed out, the long-term uh, suppression of women's participation in ways enabled or disabled by very concrete realities. And the United States does not, like many countries, have a, a federal family leave policy that's effective. If you have children in this country, you are not entitled to a range of things that makes participation in public and working life in other countries simply much more straightforward. And um, when I had my first child, I had a year's full maternity leave in your, wow. it makes a big difference to your capacity to be able to both fulfill the, uh, the sort of ambitions you have as a, as a, as an individual, as an expert or in whatever field you choose. So there are some really big structural barriers in the United States that disable this kind of participation for women or make the costs much higher. There are deep ideological divides in this country that we often think about about as political, but are also really grafted onto family ideologies and understanding of the role of families in society that also really clearly pigeonhole what women can, should, could do. And, um, and, I, and I, I do think um, this lack of role models is a huge problem. You cannot see yourself, if you cannot see yourself in that role as a young aspiring woman, and um, the, the, the choice to choose those pathways, I think, are much more difficult. So that's why these individuals become, have an outsize importance in a way that I think we would all wish that were not true, but is the case due to all that complexity of, of other factors. Rebecca, did you have any women role models in U.S. national security that led you to choose the field that you entered? I've had many women whose careers I've looked up to. Um, when I started this job in, in 2006, it was a fledgling unit at the time. Um, I was the second woman to join. And when I was promoted into the executive ranks within the department in 2012, there was one other female executive within the intelligence bureau. So we've seen- That's Out of, of how many people? Uh, not a terribly large number of people, but nonetheless, it was relatively small and appointed our first female black chief of patrol two weeks ago, which is an incredibly important position within the police department. Uh, we have female chief of our transit bureau, transportation, a female chief of counterterrorism. So the executive ranks of, of women in the department have, have really grown, even in the last 14 years that I've been in the NYPD. Um, so numbers have grown, ranks, but also importantly, the roles that women are occupying 
which are operational roles, which traditionally have been occupied by men. Um, but I haven't had the opportunity to have a very close working relationship with a woman who was my senior within the department. I've had men who've been very supportive, um, but I am very blessed with a wonderful cadre of uh, team here, two thirds of whom on the civilian side are female. So hoping to do the mentoring to uh, our program that it would have been wonderful to have a, a woman to do that with me. So it sounds like uh, you're seeing diversification, you're seeing progress in bringing more women into both operational and senior roles that they've not traditionally held. Mm -hmm. And yet you must still face a lot of the structural issues that Finola um, laid out. You know, who, who is the principal child carer and what does that do to their career? So um, how are you as a manager, as someone in the executive ranks, how do you attract a wider base of people and then make sure that their career stays on track despite, or, or do they have to choose between children versus going up the ladder? Hopefully not. And, and that's, that's the right question. So in terms of recruitment, that's where we've had, you know, great fortune. And, and that hasn't been a particular challenge is recruiting um, talented people from, uh, you know, across walks of life, including many women. Um, the retention issue is where we encounter challenges. Um, and that was my experience as well. So I have had a wonderful career here. Again, terrifically supportive um, people that I've worked for and people who've worked for me. Uh, but there are these structural impediments that are seemingly mundane. They do have a, an outsized impact things that are somewhat basic, paid parental leave. We didn't have as a city for employees of New York City paid parental leave when I had my first child, and now we do. We didn't have mother's rooms in our headquarters when I had my first child and came back from maternity leave. So I remember, you know, sneaking up into literally a closet for pumping in between meetings. Uh, now that has changed. So I think that there is growing awareness that in order to retain women, particularly women of um, young children, you need to have these structural accommodations. And that's been, I think, highlighted by the pandemic and the experience of um, our law enforcement agency, other agencies across the intel community and across law enforcement. Uh, and I'm a little worried that some of the gains that we've made over the last several years will be arrested or even um, rolled back by the pandemic. And many jobs encounter the issue of who of the couple is going to have to step out of work uh, if there is no child care or if school closes. And in law enforcement, national security, you often don't have the op option to work from home. So some of the accommodations that have been made among other professions uh, aren't available in this field. And, and I do worry a bit that that will uh, fall upon women disproportionately, both childcare as well as elder care, if you have to go into an office every day. Uh, because you have to be able to access classified information because only like cabinet members in the U.S. have um, secured uh, spaces in their homes where they can read those kind of materials. Exactly. So if you have to access classified information in the national security space or in the law enforcement domain, you know, if you have to be out on the street being mobilized, mm -hmm. uh, you don't have the option to work from home. If you are taking care of elder parents or young children um, in this current climate, that's creating added risk. And we have seen some attrition due to those factors. Uh, I do remain concerned that the progress that we've been making um, may not be sustainable in the short term as we've adjusted to the pandemic working requirements. And has it been more women staying home than men? It, it has, you know, and there's been a lot written about why that is broadly. Uh, and in this domain, I think the same factors apply. It may be that the women in the relationship and, and you know, um, a, a heterosexual relationship may have taken on more childcare responsibilities Ordinarily, they may be a lower wage earner, so it may just make more financial sense for a couple to have the woman stay home. Uh, and hopefully those are going to be anecdotal examples and they won't be 
sort of a sign of, of something larger and systemic. But I think it's something that as uh, even in this field, we have to think very carefully about how we can accommodate. And, and we have tried here that when possible, working from home was never a solution that the city really endorsed and we've made adjustments. Uh, so I think that it will force professions that have a very traditional sense of how you access information and how you do your job to be thinking a little bit outside the box to accommodate um, the demands of the moment, which will then feed into, I think, some flexibility in terms of allowing women to stay going forward. So that brings up the, the question for Fanula: has the pandemic had a similar impact on women worldwide? Have you been tracking that yet? I mean, I can only speak to maybe those of us working at sort of the level of so these sort of diplomatic and, and policy spaces in the UN around security. And I, I would also just concur with Rebecca. Traditionally, these have been highly masculine spaces. So, for example, the role I hold as UN Special Rapporteur and both of my predecessors were, were male men, um, very prominent and, and really smart men. Um, but in general, these sort of hard security roles have often been used viewed as the domain of male actors. There's a couple of reasons for that. Similarly, there's an enormous, so for my mandate, for example, a lot of travel to conflict zones, a lot of my country visits visits would involve um, visiting places of detention. So I've spent the last couple of years, um, I would say, interviewing a lot of jihadis, people who've been convicted of serious terrorism offenses, for a whole variety of reasons, those kinds of interventions and spaces may have been viewed as only spaces where sort of males could be because they had, uh, you know, the gender assumptions, the stereotyped assumptions about uh, women's capacities to function in those spaces, or the, the if you want, patriarchal assumptions about protecting women from things that they, that they, they there's a fear that they shouldn't be in those spaces, I think, have historically worked worked against, but also what we might call hardship type postings where you are working in spaces where you have my, my family, obviously I do a lot of traveling, but um, my children definitely don't travel with me. So when I'm, when I'm away from home, I'm gone for long periods of time and I may be unable, you know, I won't be easily accessible for some of that time. So that is mitigated against, as well as these assumptions about what kinds of experiences women have, whether it's in law enforcement or or as lawyers, um, I grew up in Belfast, Northern Ireland, and have spent much of my life in a conflict zone. So, um, but I think there'd be assumptions that are built into uh, much of the kind of appointment structure. Uh, in general, um, the UN is currently, there's very little travel and um, we are grounded except for, uh, you know, situations of humanitarian emergency or, but the day-to-day -day work of my office and others is, is really now online. Um, and I think that's that's really challenging uh, on the uh, and I think on the non gendered level of really doing the kind of work we need to be doing in country engaging with governments engaging with civil society actors. But as Rebecca said, and I would attest, depending we, we see disparate impact depending on family structures uh, depending on the equalities of burdens among spouses um, and depending on cultural context the, the United Nations and international actors working in the space work across multiple jurisdictions and bearing in mind that often the biggest barriers are structural barriers like good internet do our colleagues working in Afghanistan or Iraq have consistent ac access to the internet to do the kind of work we're doing? Um, is it secure? It's often not. So again, we face those kind of, um, what are, some of those are gender burdens, but some of those are burdens of sort of the, in, the, the ill distributions of the capacities to function effectively in our roles in a time of COVID. So I am curious if in terms of career development, if either of you have ever experienced the Highlander effect. I remember the Highlander movie um, from a couple decades ago. Um, there were multiple mythical characters and they each had to battle each other because quote unquote, there could be only one. Um, and in a situation where you have tokenism and you know you have a company or an organization that wants to have a couple women in the top spot so they can say, we're all right in terms of you know gender equality. We have our key women. Uh, what I have seen happen um, over my career is that sometimes that means 
rather than women being able to support each other, it pits them against each other. And um, they're literally afraid to help each other because they know the closer they get to the top, there's only one spot. Have you experienced that? And is it changing? I have not experienced that. And in fact, I must confess that this is not a movie that I have seen, but it sounds very dystopic. Um, From a while ago. <laughs> I, I haven't. Um, and I do think it's very important that, you know, if you are consciously trying to create a diverse workforce, you anticipate the different ways in which the different individuals you're hiring will be able to grow and succeed. Uh, and, and so, no, and I think um, we have a unique program here. So, you know, my colleagues on, on the uniform side, I'm a civilian and have many uniform colleagues. Um, many of them are from New York. I am from New Mexico. Uh, we come from very different backgrounds and educational and work experiences. And so gender is one of many ways in which uh, I probably am different from. And then again, similar to, to my colleagues. So it doesn't feel uh, that it is competitive and people really are bringing different perspectives to the table, which I think is uh, a strength of this department. Certainly I have heard stories from elsewhere of that effect and, and I think it's very unfortunate. Again, I think that as you're opening up the spigot and allowing for greater representation among women for these spots, uh, the fact of two women competing for a spot will be far less material than two qualified people who bring different defining characteristics to a particular spot at the table. That's great to hear, but that's an ideal world that I did not grow up in. Uh, Fidula, you, you might be closer to my generation. Uh, have you experienced that ever? And have you seen the Highlander? I have not. It did not make it to Ireland. So at least at least the Ireland that I grew up in or, or lived in, I've lived in for much of my life. So I but it's on my it's on my movie list now. And I will say that I have not experienced that either. I think so. I would say and this is very much from where I came from as a lawyer working in the national security arena and then through and a, and a law professor. And um, my experience was that there were very few women in the room and um, in general, but also that certainly growing up and living and working in Belfast for two decades. And, and this may be the product of living in a highly stressful, highly um, challenging in, environment, political and, and conflict environment, that um, there was an enormous amount of solidarity, partly because, you know, people woke up in the morning and wondered what, whether they would, you know, see the next day. I mean, in the sense that threat to your life was real and, and ongoing. And so I think that changes the dynamics of how people engage with each other. Um, and there can be, oddly enough, at the ends of conflicts, nostalgia for conflict because people had better relate, you know, the, the sort of post 9-11 moment where everybody connects and feels connected. And um, that, that has enormous allure and can be very um, can be very affirming in ways that are non-obvious, even as you work through really, really challenging times. I would also say that, um, and it's, I think this is true of all of the women I know in working in national security, that they've had extraordinary mentorship from men. And I think we have to acknowledge who our allies are. And I, I, that has also been really true for me professionally. And the other thing I think that's really extraordinary is I've had exceptional mentorship from men who don't also fit gender stereotype roles, men who've had you know, who work in national security spaces, who um, who exhibit many of the, what we might think of as quintessential feminine qualities in many ways, who are profoundly empathetic, who, who become deeply upset and traumatized by dealing with really great challenges every day, who, and I, I think part of our mutually kind of affirming role here is not only to open up spaces for women in national security, but to see a broader array of those kind of attributes, the whole variety of attributes that men bring to the table. And it's extraordinarily important when men are empathetic. I've seen it, for example, in the context of dealing with victims of terrorism where, um, you know, I, I, I don't think empathy is a gender specific trait, nor should it be. And the power of, of sharing out and, and but aren't you in the mostly in the aid field? Isn't that 
what people who are drawn to working for the UN, drawn to working in the human rights field. So, so that's also self-selecting in terms of the people who feel that empathy and want to do something about what they're seeing and unfolding in front of them. And I guess I'd say in the sense that the mandate I hold is not an aid mandate, we work primarily with intelligence agencies and governments who are implementing counterterrorism. I, 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 yeah, I guess I meant, I meant, the, <laughs> so, I meant the, 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 the I, public but, view of the UN writ large, aid yes. becomes uh, aid human rights, the yeah. whole um, gathering of people who are, you know, seen as uh, trying to do good for the world yeah. and have no, that I, I can altruistic that. mission. I can see that. Um, but I, I think I would say again, and this is maybe behooves us to think about what does security space mean, right? And how, you know, you know, I think we've had a really momentous shift in security thinking around hard CT, hard counterterrorism actually being, whether that is in fact the most effective means to address the conditions conducive to violence in societies or in communities. I think we've learned those lessons that that hard CT doesn't actually work always the way we intend it to and has rules of unintended consequences. So, And that is a perfect pivot to, in the five minutes we've got left, to go back to that question you had. I'd like to start with Rebecca and then go to Fanula of how is policymaking by women, uh, especially women leaders, different than what men bring to the table? Well, I'm very interested in Fanula's response to this question because, you know, I haven't... Um, spent as much time looking deeply at the ways in which different leaders are, are making policy. Um, but how about within your own universe? Within my own universe, I would say, and again, we're, we're talking about small data, right? There aren't, I can't say definitively, this is the female leadership style that I've observed either in the intelligence context or the law enforcement context. And this is the male style. There's such variety within uh, the the genders of, of leadership style. And I've seen very hard bitten responses coming from women and I've seen very empathetic responses coming from men. So it's very different. It's difficult for, for me to generalize. However, I do think that in a field in which you are engaging with community in the law enforcement context and thinking back over um, the, the roiling of the summer, right? If, about law enforcement interaction with community members, it matters very much uh, that people who are on the streets experience a police force that is representative of them, right? And so that means diversity in all domains. And so the engagement that you may have uh, with a female police officer may be different than the engagement you have with a male police officer. And that may or may not be grounded in any concrete difference in that individual, uh, but the um, stereotypes that individuals bring to the table in the first place may end up being helpful if you think about de-escalating, right? And if, if um, your instinct isn't to escalate as much in the engagement with a, a female officer, then that officer can be very effective. So I don't necessarily think it is a matter of an individual's intent being gendered, but the, the perception that people have when they come to any kind of interaction on the street and that will be very, very important. Um, I have to say, I did just see that at Black Lives Matter Plaza outside the White House on election eve. Um, a Trump supporter came in the middle of that crowd um, and he had a message that he wanted to give and a crowd of people grew around him. It was getting very hostile. It looked like it was going to be a fight. Um, there were some cops standing by they were trying not to intervene. And then a woman cop just waded into the crowd, went straight up to the, the Trump supporter and put her arm around him. And the air went out of the balloon. And he just turned to her and he's like, this woman's amazing. She's a real cop. And just, it diffused the whole thing. And he walked away. Um, and it was really until the woman stepped in, um, we were going to have a, we were going to have blood spill. Interesting. Interesting. Yeah, I, I think there is a lot of potential in, in moments like these where stereotypes are upended and people are really left to their own devices and saying, OK, I have to engage with this person as another person and evaluate them based on what I'm seeing and experiencing rather than what I'm mapping on to them, um, which I think could give you a lot more of the conditions for a successful interaction.
And, uh, you know, this being Zoom, I misread the clock a little bit. I think we still have about 10 minutes left. So, Fanula, over to you. What, what are some of the things that you see as differences in how women and men make policy, given the fact that you just outlined very eloquently how um, some men are as empathetic, if not more, than some women? Yeah, no, and I, I think there's two kind of, I want to say, contradictory things going on in this space. One piece of it is actually that the gender essentialisms are sometimes true, namely that there are a set of life skills and experiences of femaleness, female body, female experience that are brought into the national security decision making or operational space that can be transformative to how that space is conceived. And I have sat in rooms where I've seen that in action, where it, it's simply a different kinds of, of, of life experiences um, and having a diversity of people in the room, including a diversity of bodies in the room makes a difference to the way the problem is conceptualized, the way the conversation happens, I think, and the kind of modalities of how problems are articulated and also what's seen as the solution. So I think that's that can happen. So then I, I do think sometimes, and I see this in my own work, in my own role, is that leaning into that gender essentialism sometimes helps you. And I, I certainly know there are times when I have done that in rooms where um, being tougher is than, than expected um, can be unsettling for the other side. Um, and, you know, Forgive but me. I think it works the other way that sometimes the, it, the, the, the danger of that is, is that we make presumptions about, about femaleness or maleness that don't hold true. So you're trying to sort of ride the fact that both of these things could be simultaneously true at the same time. So if I could ask and reveal my ignorance, I don't know what you mean by gender essentialism. I've never heard the term. So to me, maybe I, this is my, my, my feminist theory piece of my, the idea that there are essentially feminist or women characteristics that, so something essential means only women can be carers, right? And um, men are essentially tough. Um, that's a gender essentialism. So yeah. it's really taking character traits and kind of hardwiring them into either male or female personages and assuming them to be true at all times and always. So that's what I mean by essentialisms, that sometimes if we lean into those things, they help us. And sometimes when you're the only woman in the room, you do lean into some gender essentialisms to get what you want or need. And sometimes you don't have to. And I think we all, all of us women who work in these spaces do it. I think probably every woman who's in a position of power does that and is conscious of it, knows that she's doing it. And um, I think that's also underestimated, right? That, that, we, that, it's, that, that we don't have a full, maybe we even underestimate how we do it when we're doing it. So that brings up uh, the question in the time we have uh, left just a quick how do you feel when you're the type of woman who might embrace the essential um, uh, identity that most people are familiar with of the, the tough love mothering versus the one who embraces um, the flirtatious um, more traditional vamp style of getting their way at work I hope those aren't the only two options. <laughs> uh, good point. Good point. But you know, you know what I mean. I, I've seen so, some women who very studiously uh, like go to work and they're like, I'm not a woman at work. I am just a professional doing the job. And other women who really lean into um, some of these more traditional gender roles as their way of managing the world around them. And it, it, it can create, problems and confusion sometimes um, when you're trying to blaze a path of just being a professional doing a job. It's so interesting. And I wonder, and this is hugely um, generalizing, but there's, I think now an emphasis that didn't exist, or I wasn't as aware of it 15 years ago, an emphasis on authenticity um, quite apart from gender, quite apart from any other aspect of identity, but 
just in terms of you bringing to the table who you are as a person and your preferred style of engagement as one of the more credible ways to lead from where you are in an organization. And, and so I wonder to what degree gender is just an aspect of your authentic humanness and that you bring with you your power as a leader from really engaging naturally with people. And so the, I'm going to just be a mask and a professional divorced from who I am as a human may seem like the better choice if you are a woman among all men in an environment, uh, but actually ends up being a little bit alienating both for you because you're not having that degree of kind of credible human engagement as well as the people you're interacting with. And so the kind of reversion to uh, I am going to be who I am and that's how I'm going to lead from wherever I am in the organization feels like a stronger and more natural position. Um, it is fantastic to hear that uh, we've evolved to that point. I, I am betraying I um, like all the scars from out. my careers. Yeah. <laughs> I mean, and, I would just add that I think that, and maybe to use another feminist word, intersectional, that we're like made up of all of these things. And some of, the, some, some of that is a body. Some of that is where we come from. Some of that is the language we speak, the religion we practice, the, the life. So partly that, I think that relates to Rebecca's comment about authenticity. But the other thing I think that really matters in the national security space for women, or at least women, the, my experience is that being a professional matters. I, I, when I have to lean into anything else, what I lean into is I'm a really good lawyer. I'm a very competent lawyer. And so I think that what we, beyond anything else, we work in a highly challenging field where the, where the stakes are really high in really fundamental ways for people's lives, for people's uh, rights, for people's experiences, for the way in which governments governance works. And so I think that what we bring most of all to the table is our like our skill set, how good we are at what we do. And I think that's what wins. That's what I hope wins. And that's what um, I think continues to, to not just make us successful as individuals, but really helps us transform the things we are in the business of transforming and the roles that we are in. I completely agree with that. Yeah competence, capability, beyond everything else, the most important. I think that is a fantastic place to leave it. Um, Rebecca, Fanula, thank you both for a fascinating discussion, a very authentic discussion. And thanks to the Sufan Center for sponsoring this. Thank you. Thank you. Five, four, three.